Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2020 Bibliometrics and Research Assessment Symposium. My name is Chris Belter, and I'm one of the event co-hosts for uh, the next three days, really. Uh, I just have a couple of quick announcements, just in case anybody joined the session um, after the, the, this morning's keynote. Uh, we are recording this session, but we're not recording either the attendees or the chat box, so you're not going to be part of any recording that we actually make. Audio is in broadcast only, um, so all attendees are automatically muted. They don't need to join the audio session or do anything else to get audio. Um, so be aware of that. You're also not going to be able to unmute, so all questions are going to be handled through the chat box. Please send questions to everyone and not uh, events organizers or hosts. We're not able to keep up with questions sent directly to us in the chat, so please do send chat questions to everyone, and some of our monitors will be able to, to help you and answer your questions. Finally, live captions are available in the Multimedia Viewer panel, and they are also available in a browser URL, so feel free to use those uh, to get started. So with that, I am going to kick off the next session, um, the next panel session around um, roles for librarians in research impact services. So I am joined by a number of colleagues from um, around the U.S., and we're really going to talk about sort of a conceptual framework that we came up with for what research impact services look like within libraries. So as I mentioned, I'm joined by my colleagues Karen Gutzman, Tyler Nix, and Amy Suter. Uh, we're all biomedical librarians from a range of institutions throughout the U.S. And what we're going to do today is we're going to start out by just giving you an overview of this conceptual framework that we came up with um, to just sort of organize what, how, we just, how to think about the provision of research impact services within a library setting. We'll then zoom in on each of the individual roles and give you a couple of examples of what those roles look like. So we'll talk more in detail about uh, what the role is, what it entails, and um, we'll give you some examples of what that role looks like within our daily activities within our various institutions. So we'll go through each one of those, and then at the end, hopefully, we'll have about 10 minutes or so uh, for a discussion where we can answer questions about the framework, get some feedback from you all about this conceptual framework, and sort of help move things forward. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in with my introduction. So I want to start by talking a little bit about some of our motivations for why we even came up with this in the first place. Um, so as I hope I don't have to tell anyone on this webinar, bibliometrics is really an emerging service area within libraries. Um, obviously, our colleagues in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia have kind of been there first and have been doing this for a long time. But I think it's still fair to say that this is still something of a new service area within libraries. And we're all kind of still trying to figure out what it is we're trying to do within this sort of larger framework. So as a result, we've all kind of done things in our own ways. Um, so we've been able to respond very quickly to questions as they come in. We've sort of stood up services um, at our own institutions to really try and respond to the various kinds of questions that we've been getting in libraries and are increasingly getting in the past couple of years. So as I said, that's been a good thing to allow us to move quickly, but it's also left us a bit fragmented in both terms of uh, library communities, having communities of practice, but also in terms of sort of our conceptual frameworks. We've all kind of done things a little bit differently um, as we've implemented these services in our libraries. So what I think we wanted to do is take a step, a, a, take a step back a little bit and come up with a little bit of a unifying framework for what it is that we're trying to achieve here. 
So now that we've got a critical mass of libraries, instituting services, we've seen a number of these services stood up in libraries in different ways across um, both the U.S. and around the world. I think it'd be helpful for us, again, to step, up, to step back a little bit and just say, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve, both in order to move us forward as a profession to in providing these kinds of services and also think strategically about how we want to advance these services and move forward. So that's what we're really trying to do today is to present an up, a draft framework of this kind of conceptual framework. So that framework is uh, shown here on the slide. So the framework really revolves around these four roles. Um, and the roles are of educator, data manager, analyst, and strategist. Now, I want to say at the outset that there's a lot of overlap among these categories. The, the, def, the divisions between these categories are very blurred. Um, and in most cases, most of us are going to provide services wearing multiple hats. We're going to be providing services in multiple roles. But I think it's useful from a conceptual standpoint to distinguish them because in some ways they have certain sets of questions uh, that are dis conceptually distinct from one another and sets of activities that are somewhat different um, among the different roles. So again, let me just run through them very quickly uh, just to give you a sense of what they are and then we'll zoom in um, on each one of these in particular to flesh them out in a little bit more detail. So the first role that I want to talk about is the educator role. Um, the educator is really focused on providing education around ideas of research impact, bibliometrics, research assessments, and all of these other kinds of ideas. The, edu these, the activities that can be done within the educator role take a, are, have, are very broad. Um, there's there's a, a range of activities that are involved here. This can be anything from answering direct reference questions about you know, what is an H index or what is an impact factor, all the way through to providing um, very detailed hands-on sessions about how to do topic modeling in R, um, or how to actually create a, a researcher profile in order to get your data in the right format to get the kinds of citation metrics that people are asking for. So again, within each one of these roles, there's a range of activities and a range of specialization. The second role that I want to talk about is the data manager. The data manager is a bit more of an active participant in the analysis process. So the data manager is really focused on gathering and curating data for these kinds of impact assessments and impact analyses. Um, again, it can be as simple as getting a bunch of publications in the citation reference software um, to make sure that you've got a researcher's accurate set of publications, all the way through to running um, an institutional, institutional repository or researcher profiling system. So it's really about making sure that the data are correct and are sliced and diced in the ways that are necessary for an, an accurate evaluation to actually take place, or an inaccurate analysis to actually take place. The third role is the analyst. And so, again, this is a bit more of an active role. And here, the, the role is about actually crunching the numbers, doing the analyses. Um, so, again, this is about um, generating an H index or generating a, a percentile rank or generating percentile ranks for a set of publications, um, all the way through to doing more advanced kinds of collaboration analyses, topic analyses, and so forth. Um, so, this, in this, this is, again, a much more active role in um, the assessment ecosystem. The final role is of the strategist. Um, and the, the strategist is very similar to the analyst role, but in many ways, the, there's a conceptual shift between um, the analyst and the strategist, and the strategist is focused more on what should we be doing. The analyst is focused on what have we done, whereas the strategist is more forward thinking in thinking about what is possible, what's coming next, um, analyzing data to identify opportunities for future research. 
So a couple of quick observations about the entire framework. One is that there's no value judgment inherent in any of these roles. None of these roles is more important than any of the others. Um, there's just increasing levels of specialization and technical skill required to actually carry out the work in these different roles. There's also levels of specialization within roles, as I alluded to in the beginning. Um, there's very simple types of, of activities within each role, all the way through to more complica complicated and complex kinds of activities. And then finally, there's, as I said, there's a lot of overlap among these different roles and among these, these different activities. So when you're an analyst, for example, in many cases you're going to also be both a data manager and an educator because when you're doing a consultation for an analysis, you need to have the skills from the educator to be able to explain the options, explain what's necessary, and explain um, about the kinds of metrics that could be used in a particular analysis scenario. You're also going to need skills from the data manager to know how to actually carry that work out, and then you need additional skills within the analyst role to actually carry those analyses out. So that's a very, very quick introduction and um, overview of the kinds of things that are happening within this conceptual framework. So I'm now going to, um, we're now going to zoom in a little bit and uh, do a series of case studies of what these activities look like within um, individual libraries. So up first, we have Tyler Nix uh, from the University of Michigan to talk about the educator role. Tyler, are you there? Hi, Chris. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so thanks, Chris. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm uh, Tyler Nix at the University of Michigan Taubman Health Sciences Library, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the educator role as we've defined it within the framework and then provide um, two or three examples of how I work within that role at the University of Michigan. Excuse me. Okay, so as Chris mentioned earlier in the overview, um, the educator is really this, we picture this role as being focused on answering questions around uh, the general framework of what can I do, what can we do um, within, you know, working with um, biliometric indicators and assessment questions. So we see the educator primarily as doing work around developing training sessions um, on publication indicators and tools. Um, and best practices, um, and doing a lot of consultation with researchers and administrators on using indicators to meet assessment needs. So again, this could be, uh, this is really, I think, bread and butter for probably a lot of us um, on the call today, and um, some of the examples of questions that educators might be um, working with day to day might be things like, um, should I maintain an online research profile? And if so, which, which one is the best? Um, our department needs guidance on tracking our publications. How can you, uh, how can we go about doing that? Um, it could be something like what indicators should our team use to demonstrate our impact? Um, and so the educator could be in a role of both sort of explaining the context within their individual institution of what tools and metrics might be available at their institution. Um, and also, hopefully as well, doing some grassroots education around some of the best practices um, of using metrics responsibly, like matching indicators to needs and trying to measure what matters most to, to a particular group. Um, so before I move on, I'm going to kind of walk through a few examples of, of my work in the educator role at Michigan. But um, if you have sort of examples or certain things you want to highlight about your experience as an educator, um, please feel free to um, use the general channel in the Slack, um, in the Slack channel to sort of share some experiences there, and we'll keep an eye on those as well as monitoring um, the Q&A. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so. 
The sort of main example I want to talk about in working in the educator role at Michigan, um, I'm presenting this on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Judy Smith and Sarah Samuel. And we, um, we started an education-based initiative in 2017 called the Research Impact Core. And our primary goal with starting this education initiative was to raise awareness um, around sort of the expertise that we had within the library around bibliometric indicators um, and assessment, um, to educate the health sciences community on the tools and resources that were available on campus, and to promote the responsible uses of metrics within our community. Um, and we really focused this as an education initiative from the get-go, because when we first started this, there were, there were two of us working on the impact core, um, and we were each allocating about 25% of our time um, to the impact core. And so we felt like if we were to focus from the beginning more on the analysis role or like uh, creating um, um, deliverables or creating reports, um, we might be out of, we might not be able to scale that um, and we might be out of our depth pretty quickly just in terms of the amount of work that that could generate. Um, so we really focused on an education role because it was a way for us to get started quickly. Um, we started with a library research guide and um, by developing uh, an open workshop or two and some promotional materials and really just working to plug in um, with the communities on campus that were already uh, doing this work. Um, so it allows it allowed us to start quickly um, and engage uh, with the research development staff across the medical school. Um, we got to do some course integration early on, and uh, we also were able to connect with the med school's office of faculty development training series, um, and that's uh, what I want to talk about next. So if we could go to the next slide. So by con connecting our, our uh, newly developed um, information uh, sort of open training session over to a faculty development training series, um, this allowed us to get some footholds for um, branching out with consultations and, and working with particular departments. And we tailored this session um, to work with early career investigators. Um, and this is great because um, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of variation even within our local context around how metrics are used within promotion and tenure and things like that. Um, but we found early career investigators to be very interested in this topic, sort of regardless of what um, their departmental contexts were like. Um, so this session is aimed um, at a, we, we provide an overview of metric strengths and weaknesses. Um, we introduce these researchers to the sort of the broader conversation around um, things like the Leiden Manifesto and DORA and um, matching indicators to their specific needs. Um, and we provide some case studies and some examples of using metrics in personal statements that they might be asked to write at some point and ways that they can um, create an online profile and, and sort of elevate their, um, their researcher profile online. Next slide. And one other example from the educator role that I want to quickly highlight um, is a training role that we have developed with our research information management system on campus um, or our faculty profiling system. Um, so at the University of Michigan, we happen to use uh, symplectic elements for our faculty profile tool. And the system itself is actually administered by the Medical School Office of Research. Um, so we don't take a direct administrative role in the library, but that really allows us to focus our efforts um, on the training side. And so we, we are on the governance uh, group overall and, and really focus our efforts on training. And one of the things that we did there um, was last year we hosted an edit-a-thon uh, to raise awareness about uh, some changes to the platform and to train, uh, to try and train both some administrative staff and faculty on profile management. 
So we scheduled this as an afternoon drop-in session where we would present um, a short presentation and a demo at the top of each hour. And then we would dedicate the rest of each hour um, to working individually and, and with small groups um, of either the administrative staff or faculty who, who came and went throughout the afternoon. Um, so that's just a few, a few examples of, of what the educator role could look like. Um, I know that many of you are working in this area. There's a poster from this morning, actually, um, from uh, UNT about a new um, education service that they started. Uh, so please feel free to, to um, chime in and share your examples. Um, and I see a question in the chat from Manuel. Um, what were the topics that were of most interest to early career investigators during the series? I would say we get the most questions about altmetrics and about um, online profiles and sort of how to go about um, shaping your, your online um, researcher presence. Um, in addition to, to questions just about some of the metrics themselves and how they're calculated, I, I think the, the alt metrics and the online presence are usually sort of of most interest. Um, uh, to, to generalize a little bit, and we, we took that as an opportunity our, um, on the team to develop a sort of a standalone spinoff presentation as well that's about strictly about um, online profiles and, and um, um, presenting your, your research online. Um, there's another question from Tyler Martindale. I missed if you said this, but what platform is your Michigan Research Experts built on? It looks like possibly Vivo or Pure. We are using uh, symplectic elements for our system, which is uh, by digital science. Okay, so if there are no further questions, um, I will hand it off to uh, Karen Gutzman, who is gonna talk to us about the data manager role. Hi, um, one quick thing, can everyone hear me? I can hear you just fine. And Chris, you will be advancing the slides? I will indeed. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so I'm Karen Gutzman. I serve as the Head of Research Assessment and Communication at the Galter Health Sciences Library and Learning Center at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, so um, I'm gonna be talking about the data manager role. So the data manager role focuses on identifying and selecting resources to support data collection, cleaning, and transformation of bibliographic metadata that can be used for analysis-related projects. The data manager role may also build or otherwise support systems or software platforms, dashboards um, for tracking publications, collaborations, or metrics that are being used for analysis. The data manager must stay current on developments or changes to data and its structures. Uh, changes to interfaces or APIs, and changes uh, in data availability from various sources. The data manager's focus is on answering questions related to individual researchers and groups within the organization. So I'm going to cover some examples of how I work as a data manager, and if you identify with this role because of your work and would like to share examples, I would love to hear them. Uh, I'm sure others would too, so please add them to the general Slack channel. And if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat. So uh, next slide, um, the data manager is often asked to collect and clean bibliographic data that has been tracked for individuals or groups within the institution. Uh, one source of data might be the university's research information management system. At Feinberg School of Medicine, we use symplectic elements to track research outputs for our faculty, staff, and students. So in the example on this slide, within my role as data manager, I needed to report on all the publications by a particular de department at Feinberg School of Medicine within the last five years. Specifically, I needed to retrieve unique identifiers for each publication, such as the scope of EID or the Web of Science UT or the DOI or the PMID, if the identifier was available in our elements database, so that we could review the publication data and the resulting metrics um, in the Scopus, Web of Science, or Insights Benchmarking and Analytics interfaces. So to perform this, 
I um, connected to the Elements Reporting Database, which lives on a remote database server. The server has Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio and Report Builder installed. So using those tools, I query the Elements Database using custom SQL queries that I've built over time for common requests. Um, writing these queries requires an in-depth knowledge of data structure, um, and I have to keep up to date on any changes whenever Elements releases a new version of their software. Um, I have my query saved in a GitHub repository. Um, in that repository, I have the query itself. I have an example of the output and the column headers, which can be expected. Um, I do some of the transformation of the data using SQL, such as joining various tables and pivoting data within the table. But further transformation and cleaning is usually done in Microsoft Excel, OpenRefine, or just using Python scripts, depending on the need. Go to the next slide. Uh, the Data manager may be asked to track or provide basic reports on publications by faculty members. Um, so this might be one that you're very familiar with. Um, in the example on this slide, I've been asked to track our faculty's publications each month in, specific, in a specific list of journals. So I use a custom search in Web of Science and PubMed to identify the papers. Then I export the bibliographic data into an EndNote library. I then export the citations from EndNote into Microsoft Word, where the titles are then hyperlinked to the publisher's version of the article, and the Northwestern author names are bolded. Um, I should note that I'm working on automating this so that I can kind of bypass EndNote altogether, but EndNote is a really great tool for this. Um, and this report is provided each month to the Office of Communications and to our Dean's office. We'll go to the next slide. Um, occasionally, literature database interfaces won't be sufficient for data collection for larger projects. So the data manager may be um, make use of APIs to request data and use coding languages like Python and tools like Jupyter Notebook to further clean and organize the data. So in this example, um, I query the Scopus API using um, multiple Scopus author IDs. And then instead of just retrieving one large list of publications like I would maybe in the Scopus interface, I can actually parse the response so that each author in my query is listed next to their publication. Um, though writing the original code for this took some time, I can now use this code over and over, and running the code is actually very quick. And uh, I do build in a few minutes of time for myself to check the final data set to make sure nothing's wrong. Um, in my Python code, I make use of uh, the built-in request library to access the Scopus API. And then I use Python libraries like Pandas and NumPy to organize and analyze the data, which I can then export as a CSV. Um, I saved and shared my code in GitHub so that it's easily available for me or my team to use on common requests. And I also have similar code that I've written for interacting with the Web Science API and the Insight Benchmarking Analytics API. So the next slide. Um, often data managers will use different tools depending on the needs of the groups involved in the project. So um, in the past, you know, I've mentioned Jupyter Notebooks, but in this example, the group that I work with was really familiar with Google tools. So instead, I used Google Colab uh, to share data and code and visualization. Um, in this particular case, they were interested in looking at various metrics and visualizations, um, such as what's shown here as a scatter plot that shows like the number of publications against the average percentile and subject area for faculty, um, for documents published by faculty members in their department. So uh, these were just some examples. Of course, there's a lot of different ways the data manager um, fulfills their role. Um, but uh, again, we'd love to hear them in Slack. And if you have any questions, please um, put them in, in uh, chat. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to pass it off to Amy Suter, who's going to share her experiences with the analyst role. Hi, so thank you, Karen. Um, my name is Amy Suter, and I'm a librarian at Becker Medical Library at Washington University in St. Louis. And I'm really excited to be here and talk a little bit about the analyst role. Um, so the analyst is uh, ultimately putting these bibliometric data for to use. So we're doing analyses and often preparing reports. Um, and those reports may include narrative description, interpretation, um, as well as charts, tables, figures, or other data visualizations. We're working with individuals and, and groups to, to help them demonstrate their research impact. And this can be for you know, promotion and tenure or to justify a space request or a fancy piece of equipment. Um, but it can also be for grant applications um, that may be external to the institution. 
the analyst is also uh, starting to look beyond their own institution, and they may get requests related to benchmarking or recruitment. I mean, ultimately, we're trying to support decision making, and so I'm going to go through a couple of examples here. Next slide, please. Um, so in this example, we got a request to ident identify some candidates um, for job openings, and the request was that they wanted to the um, individuals to be researchers in a specific topic area that were also practicing clinicians. So we started with a search in Scopus and compared that to um, a known faculty member in that research area to see how well the search was matching up. And then we took that into SciVal, um, one of the tools that we have access to. And that helped us narrow down the candidates that had been publishing in the in the topic area in a um, relatively recent time frame. We then combine these data with um, some information from the American Board of Radiology. They have a certification tracker. So we combine that information with the bibliometrics in order to help narrow it down to who was likely to be a practicing clinician. So the certification checker isn't a perfect match, but it helped us narrow it down from just all researchers in this topic. This report was just in Excel. It went to a research administrator. They are, at least this one happens to live in Excel, um, and he combined that with other reports and other analyses that were coming from other groups. Um, so it wasn't just us, but it really worked out for them. And in the next example, uh, we had a request from another research administrator, actually. Um, they had seen some network analyses that we've done, and they came to us and asked if they could see uh, one for their group. They had recently gotten a grant that was multi-institutional, and they wanted to see if folks were co-authoring across those institutions. So this is a relatively small data set. It was only three years of data. Um, this is a network analysis, so the circles or nodes are the authors on the papers, and the lines between them represent publications that they've co-authored. What we did was we color-coded these based on the institution that the uh, researcher was working at, and we hid or we stripped out all the other authors in the network so they could just see the folks um, on the grant. We showed this to the PIs, and they were kind of excited about it because it confirmed what they had suspected, that there wasn't a lot of cross-institutional collaboration going on, at least in publications. So they may be collaborating other ways, but they hadn't been co-authoring together. And this visualization helped give them um, sort of a picture uh, that they could then use to go back and make decisions and try to figure out what was what they needed to improve. This is still relatively early on in their in their grant. As Chris mentioned before, the model has fluidity, so we expect you know, people to move between the roles. So I'm actually going to change or to ask Karen to um, take these next two examples because uh, she has moved between data manager and analyst role. Hi. So just. Um, a further example of some work that Amy had mentioned um, on analyzing collaboration. So this was just an example of how um, we were looking at mentors um, for a group that was applying for a training grant um, and wanting to, they wanted to know how well the mentors in the grant were connected um, and they wanted a visualization for that. And so we provided several options um, and this is just one that, that um, seemed to go over very well with them. And then the next slide really quickly is um, just an example of a, um, a report where we have summarized some data based on some questions that came into us. Um, we worked with a department on campus that was applying to a funding opportunity, and they really wanted to highlight how they um, were particularly strong in a research area. Um, and so we provided them with data and analysis. We wrote several statements for them, um, and then after um, several conversations back and forth, they kind of landed on one of the statements that we wrote that they would include in their submission. So. Oh, and then the next step would be Chris, uh, and he's going to cover the strategist. 
Thanks, Karen. So I am back up to talk a little bit more about uh, the strategist role and um, give you, again, some examples of what this role actually looks like in some of my day-to-day -day work at the National Institutes of Health. So the strategist is, as I said, really focused on thinking about what's next and what we ought to be doing in the future. So that kind of breaks down into two major areas. The first is it helps uh, the institution decide how to evaluate and assess research. We heard a lot about this from Lizzie this morning, which was some really great context about this. And so the strategist is in some ways responsible for carrying out a lot of that work that you talked about regarding responsibility in assessment and um, analysis and evaluation. To some degree, this happens also in the analyst role, but it's also, I think, um, conceptually fits within the strategist role as well. The other major thing that the strategist does is it looks for opportunities for future research. Um, so it looks beyond what's already happening within an institution and says, okay, what's next? What else could we be doing? Um, who could we be working with? What topics are we interested in? Um, and really sort of thinking forward into what might be possible um, for future research. So a couple of examples um, that I've been working with at the National Institutes of Health. One is around helping to, uh, to develop evaluation frameworks for how evaluation and research assessment ought to look at a, an institution like the National Institutes of Health. One of the things that we've found very useful and that I've um, been trying to push for within the NIH is the use of logic models for organizing and conceptually sort of approaching evaluation and assessment exercises. What's nice about a logic model is it keeps our focus on the long-term outcomes, um, the things that we're really trying to achieve with the research that we're doing. And within the National Institutes of Health, it's very obvious that what we're trying to do is to improve people's health. So within that context, it's very, it's a lot easier to put things like citation metrics into the broader framework to say, look, these are important because they get us to some of our short-term outcomes that we're interested in. So advancing knowledge, creating new uh, researchers, doing those kinds of things, but it doesn't necessarily get us to that long-term outcome that we're really interested in in improved health. So it, again, allows us to put some of these metrics in context and to say, what else can we do? How else can we measure things? How else can we say, are we moving from our inputs and our outputs to our long-term outcomes of improving people's health? Another thing that we're doing um, at NIH, and I'm working with some of the funding agencies within the NIH to do, is to identify research gaps. So we're looking at research on particular topics that we're interested in and say, okay, what's being done? Where, where is the research currently so that we can look for gaps that, isn't, that aren't being done or the gaps in the research that aren't being addressed? What you're looking at here is a, a collection of about 24,000 publications on the topic of cancer, uh, cancer rehabilitation. So what we're able to do is to look at this um, set of literature to say, okay, what are the major research areas? How well connected are these research areas in terms of topical focus? And then show this to subject matter experts to say what's missing, what's not here, or where are the emphases not where we should be? Um, one particular example that came out of this exercise was we were able to say there was a lot of research around the cognitive function um, and cognitive and emotional rehabilitation for cancer treatment, but there wasn't a lot of focus on the physical rehabilitation or recovery of physical function. So that was something that we were able to say this is a gap in the research that we need to address in um, future funding announcements and future research. Another example uh, that we work on um, as the strategist is to identifying emerging research areas. So looking for areas that are up and coming or areas within disciplines that may be getting a lot of attention and a lot of publication activity over time. 
What we're looking at here is a collection of about 50,000 publications on the topic of cancer immunotherapy. And we're looking at it over again 50 years um, to look for changes in publication emphasis over time. So even though cancer immunotherapy is a very hot topic these days, there are very specific areas within that larger umbrella that are really trending these days, including the, the topic of immune checkpoint blockade, which got the, the Nobel Prize a few years ago. So again, we're able to use some of this information to make more informed decisions about, you know, if we know where research is going, if we know what some of these emerging areas are, then we can make more dis more informed decisions about what kinds of research we want to encourage in the future. A third thing that the strategist does is it questions assumptions within the research ecosystem. What we're looking at here is um, publications on the topic of Alzheimer's disease. And we're looking at the proportion of Alzheimer's disease publications that address certain um, hypotheses about what causes Alzheimer's disease. So there are a number of hypotheses of um, what causes it related to either amyloid beta, tau proteins, inflammation, cardiovascular disorders, and so on. So what we can do is look for the proportion of these publications that address each one of these um, hypotheses to say, where is the emphasis? How are we doing this? Um, so what we can see is that over the past decade or so, the vast majority of the literature focuses on the amyloid beta hypothesis to some degree to the exclusion of other hypotheses. Now, given this particular scenario and given the fact that we still don't necessarily know what actually causes Alzheimer's disease, it's reasonable to ask the question whether this emphasis is still warranted. Is this still working? Is this still a good idea? Or is it time for us to devote more research and more injury research emphasis to these other hypotheses? I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't know if I can answer that question. That's not necessarily my role, but it is my role to ask the question and to say, is this still working? A final example is around assessing research capacity um, of other countries. One of the things that one of the institutes within the NIH is very interested in is around furthering research capacity in low and middle income, income countries. So what we're looking at here is a collaboration network um, at the institutional level of uh, research institutions in Peru, um, and, and specifically of biomedical research within the country of Peru. So what we can see very clearly is that a couple of research institutions are really driving the vast majority of the research that's actually coming out of uh, Peru, at least as measured in um, the peer-reviewed literature that we have available. Um, so with obviously with the understanding that this is not the universe, at least we can um, have a look at what's actually happening. So then when we're looking at, assess, at strengthening research capacity in some of these countries, we know it, both where to start, but also that we know that that capacity is concentrated within certain institutions, so that maybe we want to strengthen capacity in other institutions within the country to build capacity in these other institutions to get a more pluralistic um, set of research institutions um, doing research in these countries. So that was just a very, very quick introduction to the strategist role and to the framework in general. So as promised, we are going to now shift over to do some discussion, and we're going to obviously answer questions. I saw that there were a number of questions come through through the chat, so we're definitely going to get to those. But I also wanted to mention that part of the par purpose of us doing this presentation was to get your feedback on this entire framework. So we've set up a very quick Google form um, to just allow you to give us some feedback about what you think about this framework. Does it make sense? Does it apply to you? What do you think about um, the way that we structured it? Are there things that we're missing? Or are there things that you might suggest in making that framework better? So please do give us some feedback. Um, you can see the link is being shared in the chat. We will also share it on Slack. 
Um, so please do take a couple of minutes and fill that out for us. So with that, let me put the framework back up and pause now uh, to see if we've got any questions. Yelling? Yeah. Okay, I think there is some sort of echo. Sorry, let me mute. All right. Okay, great. So uh, most of the questions have been handled by the previous speakers already. So uh, these questions are specifically for Chris. The first one is about, uh, can you share the logic models? Do you con uh, construct logic, uh, logical frameworks? So these logic models are still a bit of a work in progress. Um, I can share some of them. But again, we're still developing a lot of these and we're still sort of ironing out what all ought to be in there. So again, it's very much a work in progress. Um, I'm happy to share what I have, but just be aware that we're still ironing these things out. Okay, the next two questions are about the visualization tools that you use. So the first one is about the visualization tools you use uh, for identifying research gaps and then the tools to, uh, you use for emerging research areas. Sure, so those are very, very related to one another. Um, so it's great that I can kind of talk about these in general. So the general process that I use for both identifying research areas and emerging research areas is to gather all of the publications. I then use, um, typically I use LDA or topic modeling um, to assign publications to particular research topics and then construct either networks or time series analyses of the results of that analysis. So I do a lot of my analysis in R. Um, most of my, that's really my comfort zone. Um, there are some great models and packages available in R. So most of that is done. I, I gather data using R APIs. I run the analyses in R. And then I construct either networks or visualizations. In some cases, I'll use R. So the time series, for instance, that heat map was created within R using ggplot2. Um, the network was created in R using iGraph and then shipped over to GEPI, G-E-P-H-I, to do the, the actual network visualization and then polished off using a tool called Inkscape. So lots of tools there, um, but that's the, the basic process. Another question, do you have the uh, Git site for your R code? So I do have a GitHub site. Um, it's github.com slash Christopher Belter. Um, some of that is available, although I'll be honest, I'm not nearly as good about sharing all of my code as I really should be. Um, so there are some routines for doing some of the topic modeling. Uh, that's in that uh, text mining repo. I've got some repos for some of my API routines, um, those kinds of things. So some of that's up there. Um, I will try to do better about sharing additional code uh, with you all um, after the, the event. Another question. So if I'm hearing correctly, you're not using Site 2 as much now? That is correct, yeah. So I used Site 2 for a very, very long time. I did a lot of training on Site 2. Honestly, I've now become I've mostly worked, sort of gone out of Site 2, mostly because of scale. Um, a lot of the analyses that I do these days are in the tens of thousands of publications, and it's just a lot easier for me to stay within the R ecosystem. So I do a lot of my um, data downloads in R, using R, so it's just more convenient for me to do the network analyses within iGraph in R rather than shifting them from R to Psi2 to Gephi to Inkscape. It, it saves me a process. So I'm not using Psi2 nearly as much as I am. And Chris, again, what are your data sources? Uh, data sources really depend. It depends on the scope of the analysis, and it really depends on um, what I'm trying to do. I will use PubMed, Scopus, and Web of Science, uh, depending. Um, those are the primary data sources. 
um, though I'm exploring the use of dimensions um, for future publication analyses. But those are the, the PubMed, Web of Science, and Scopus is the one. Those, those are the major ones. Okay. Uh, can you also share a little bit more about topic modeling? Sure. So topic modeling is there are some really great um, Google sites about this. So if you actually just Google topic modeling, it actually there's some, some great information. Essentially, it's a text mining approach where in step one, it looks for term vocabularies within a set of publications. So it's a machine learning algorithm that tries to learn a vocabulary for a particular topic. And so if it says, okay, I see a lot of publications that use both lung and cancer in uh, the same document, it's probably likely that those terms describe a topic within this publication set. Once it has those vocabularies identified, it then goes through and says, okay, within each document, do I find terms from that vocabulary? So if a particular document has lung a bunch of times and cancer a bunch of times, there's a, going to be a high probability that that document belongs to this lung cancer category. So that's kind of the intuitive sense of how it works. Um, but there's a lot of really great information available. I see there's, there's some happening um, and being shared in the chat. So definitely have a look around. One last question. Will you be sharing your slides in the Slack? Sure, I'd be happy to share those. Yep. That's all from me. Great. Um, uh, Karen, Tyler, um, Amy, did I miss anything? Are there other things that we wanted to cover? So um, I just want to encourage everyone, this is Karen, um, to, if you can, take the survey. We're getting some really great responses that I think will help us shape and mold this and really think through some of these roles. And, and uh, so just encourage you again, um, it's in uh, Slack, the link to the survey. It's also, uh, it's been tweeted and it's in the chat here. Too. So thank you so much for all your responses there. All right, just a, a little bit of updates for people who are uh, curious about Lizzie's survey earlier. Lizzie has put a link uh, in the chat box, so uh, please feel free to check it out. Thank you, Chris. Sure, and thank you, everyone. So if there aren't any other questions, um, well, I guess we'll break a little bit early um, this afternoon. And so we'll take a little bit of a break and uh, we'll reconvene at 2.30, 2.30 uh, Eastern, to have a session, a panel session around alternative metrics. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll stick around for a little while um, between sessions. And you're also welcome to stick around here on the webinar um, and pick things back up when we reconvene. Thanks. <laughs>